good morning everyone uh, it's a chilly morning so good morning to everyone on a chilly morning um, i see some familiar faces so for uh, those of you uh, unfamiliar so my name is sudhindra uh, i am a principal engineer at uh, ebay ebay's uh, cloud group um, so i will be talking about uh, insightful traffic monitoring so how we leveraged uh, cilium to to build a massive uh, service dependency graph within ebay um, so my co presenter is uh, aditya Uh, so i'll be describing uh, about the problem statement and then aditya will get into the technical details and the design so ebay is a, a global marketplace uh, it's it connects millions of uh, uh, buyers and sellers worldwide so at any given point of time uh, we have around 2.1 billion uh, live listings and spread across a vast variety of uh, product categories um, so the q3 as of q3 we had a uh, sales volume of uh, around 18.3 billion dollars and we operate across 190 markets so with the vast variety of products cat items there is something for everyone to buy uh, at, at every time uh, at ebay uh, so how is this business powered so it's it's powered by our uh, infrastructure and it the infrastructure is comprised of uh, around uh, more than 5000 microservices so these range from a variety of uh, stateless services stateful services including databases key value stores we have uh, big data machine learning platforms uh, we have our own uh, scalable observability system uh, built on uh, open source technologies like uh, prometheus open telemetry and all um, we also have our own uh, software load balancers software firewalls uh, iam uh, systems and all these run on a variety of hardware um, so we have both x86 and uh, gpus and on the right side you can see our technology stack uh, so most of our workloads run on uh, kubernetes at this point Uh, with uh, you know container runtime we also have workloads running on bare metals uh, like appliances and things like that and this is how our infrastructure is uh, laid out this is a very high level overview uh, so our applications are deployed across uh, hundreds of uh, kubernetes clusters that are you know distributed across the globe Uh, we have around we have kubernetes clusters in uh, um, more than 25 uh, uh, pops or points of presence and then we also have multiple data centers uh, which are spread across multiple regions and the so what we have is you know we have the regions the data centers uh, are mapped to specific regions and in each region we have this uh, notion of an availability zone and the idea of an availability zone is it's the it uses the follows the share nothing architecture so the power cooling uh, networking it's all separate between the availability zones so the idea is a single point of failure or a single failure in hardware impacts uh, at most one availability zone and our kubernetes clusters are mapped to within the availability zones and our applications are essentially you know they are deployed across multiple azs for high availability and each of our clusters uh, typically have uh, 400 to 5500 nodes and the way we uh, have these clusters it could be based on uh, scale or it could be based on uh, uh, the security constraints such as you know pci and things like that um, so all our clusters range from 400 to 5500 nodes and the pods we have anywhere from 50000 uh, to 130000 pods uh, and typically we have you know more than 10000 uh, kubernetes services in each of these clusters and in this setup we had two problems that we wanted to solve this was about 1 uh, and 1/2 to 2 years ago so the first problem that we were looking at was uh, how do we enforce micro segmentation policies so what we wanted to do is we wanted to restrict the traffic of uh, the services to only the other services that it, it it's authorized to talk um, so that in case of a compromise 
we reduce the blast radius. Now, so this being a, a what's called a brown field, we have already had you know, 5,000 applications running uh, across the fleet. So we could not enforce the policies on day one. This would mean that you know, the availability would be impacted. So we had to discover the existing service interactions before we could actually you know, start enforcing the policies. So this was the first problem that we were looking at. Another problem was around the same time we also uh, had, uh, we were growing our service mesh across the fleet. And in service, initially with the service mesh, uh, we did uh, just the north-south uh, load balancing. So we used the service mesh purely for uh, ingress load balancers. And uh, the, the plan was to do the east-west load balancing for, without going through the central load balancers. But in order to do that, we had to push the load balancing configuration to the, the sidecars. And we could not push the configuration of entire fleet to each of the sidecars. So that would, that would not scale. So we needed um, an idea of the service interactions so that we push only the dependent services configuration to each of the sidecars. So these were the two problems that we uh, were looking at. And the answer turned out to be the building a service dependency graph. And uh, what exactly is a service dependency graph? It's a, it's a relationship where one service depends on another service for any you know, of its functionality or data. And uh, formally, you know, it can be visualized as a directed graph where the nodes of that graph uh, represent services. And uh, there is an edge if the service A calls uh, service B. So the, uh, the right side shows a representative uh, dependency graph. But in reality, it's, it's a much more complex and a large graph. Um, so with 5,000 uh, microservices, it looks something like this. Right? So we cannot, it's, it's very hard to visualize. But as we got into uh, visualizing this, collecting the dependencies, this opened up a lot of um, interesting use cases. Um, so this is to get into the, the first use case of, uh, that I mentioned uh, of segmentation. So the way we are doing it is uh, we discover the dependencies. And the, using the discovered dependencies, we create policies. And the policies, they go through approval um, from uh, like, you know, Inf InfoSec. Um, and then once the policy is approved, it gets enforced. And then we continuously monitor all the violations. And if there are new dependencies that are discovered uh, while things are, you know, policies are enforced, we again feed it back to the same system and create new policies. So apart from segmentation and uh, the uh, service mesh, there are other interesting use cases that we are, we've just started looking into these. Uh, so one is in the area of incident management. So using this uh, dependency graph, we can efficiently localize the issues. So in a long you know, service call chain, if uh, we see uh, latency increase, or if we see failures, uh, the dependency graph helps us uh, quickly isolate the issue to a specific microservice. The other analysis that could be done is uh, by overlaying the dependency graph on the physical uh, infrastructure, and uh, like we can we can analyze the uh, failure points and uh, do a DR planning. For example, you know if uh, things are co-located in a single rack things belonging to a particular business flow. So the, if the rack goes down, it can impact the business flow. So such kind of analysis could be, uh, it's possible to do with the dependency graph. Uh, the, the third area that we are uh, looking into is using this dependency graph to do a smart workload scheduling in Kubernetes, you know, in, uh, the workload scheduling across multiple clusters. So one uh, use case is, if we, if we know that service A talks to service B and there are uh, latency requirements, um, so we can actually try to co-locate them in the same availability zone or in the same rack and things like that. Right? And of course, you know, the dependency graph is also useful in um, uh, intrusion detection, in uh, detecting unusual patterns. 
And when we started building the dependency graph, we looked at the problem and we, you know, why is this problem so hard for uh, an infrastructure such as, uh, such as ours, um, which, which already has a lot of applications that are running? So there are three, three reasons. So for the first one is the feasibility. So we first looked at can we, you know, whether we can instrument the application itself uh, to record these interactions and then you know, push it to a central system. But it turned out to be not practical given the wide uh, you know, variety of applications and hundreds of uh, teams, application teams that manage these uh, applications. The, the other option for us is uh, trying to do this at uh, service mesh on the sidecars. Uh, the, we could, like we have Envoy, we use Envoy proxy as the sidecar. So we could actually you know, tap all the events, uh, the traffic at Envoy, and then do a dependency discovery. This also seemed, uh, be, uh, became uh, impractical because our service mesh adoption itself was not 100% of the fleet. Um, and the, going to the performance and scale aspects, so we had to do this uh, discovering the dependencies at scale um, and with very minimum uh, impact to the traffic. So we didn't want to uh, incur any additional, introduce latency to the data path. Uh, and of course, you know, to do this, if we had to run an agent on each of the nodes, we didn't want. Uh, we wanted the agent to consume um, as little CPU and memory as possible. And the other unique constraint that we had was uh, the getting very accurate uh, dependency graph. And within eBay, we use most of the application teams use continuous deployment, so they. Uh, when, whenever there is a code change, things uh, get merged in GitHub, it gets deployed uh, to site within uh, 90 minutes. So what this, what this meant is, as applications got deployed to the site, the, the IPs, they change quite frequently. So an IP which was assigned to a particular application could be assigned to a different application uh, at a future time. So which means that the, a system that actually kind of collects these IPs and then tries to map it to the applications has to work in uh, near real time. And these were the constraints that we were uh, facing. And the solution was, came in the form of uh, Cilium and eBPF. Um, so the design and other things will be uh, dis uh, described by Aditya. Ah, thank you, Sudhi. So we started off by exploring the observability options already available with uh, Cilium, so which are mainly Cilium Hubble and Cilium Monitor. So given that the solution is potentially going to be deployed on hundreds of thousands of nodes, we wanted to be certain of the performance characteristics of uh, each of the solutions that we were evaluating. So we have established the functional and non-functional requirements, which mainly came down to CPU and memory usage, the threshold that uh, we have set was one uh, CPU and under one gigabytes of memory in the user space and close to zero for the same in the uh, kernel space. So we started by evaluating Cilium Hubble. So Cilium Hubble is the Cilium's observability platform. It does uh, dependency tracking, flow tracking, and block tracking, and it also has a good UI which kind of maps all of this data, but the only problem being if for, in order for it to work on multiple clusters, we, it needs Cilium multi-cluster option to be enabled that we didn't have uh, enabled on our cloud due to scale requirements, so we had to drop that option. The next option that we consider was the Cilium Monitor. So Cilium Monitor is like an event tracer in Cilium. You can think of it something similar to Linux TCP dump. So we ran LNP tests on it, and unfortunately it didn't meet our uh, CPU and memory requirements. Upon delving more into the details of the implementation, it turned out that it didn't have the uh, optimized filter options that we needed. So while uh, doing all of this effort, we realized that Cilium has something called as contract, which is connection tracking, so similar to something in the Linux world, which is doing a tracking of all the 
connections inbound and outbound to optimize uh, running IP tables or the Linux firewall component. So we thought we could leverage that. So in case of uh, Cilium, the contract is maintained in an eBPF map. Uh, as you can see here, it has all the fight tuple information so that we need uh, encrypted or embedded in the uh, eBPF map key. So it has the mainly the source addresses and the destination address, the destination port, and the protocol that we need. Uh, we ran our LNP test again on this, and it was within our CPN memory thresholds. So we wanted to go ahead with this solution. The only caveat being that it only has a raw IP port and protocol data. It doesn't have any of the app metadata that we are interested in. Um, so at this point, we leveraged our eBay metric service, so which works at scale, and it is based on open telemetry. We were pushing all our metrics to this metric service, which is doing the enrichment based on multiple data pipelines and giving us the actual app meta data that we needed. So combining all of this led us to this architecture. As you can see here, we have the traffic observer pods running on each of the nodes, and it's reading the uh, contract, contract eBPF map that is written by Cilium. We're getting the source IP, destination IP, and the destination port details that we need, and we are passing it on to the uh, cluster local open telemetry collectors uh, using a, a persistent gRPC connection. And all of these, in turn, individual uh, open telemetric connections are connected to the central metric service, which is doing the enrichment part. So the enrichment, uh, the source of truth for the enrichment pipelines itself is again uh, the Kubernetes clusters where it gets all the app metadata for the container, containerized applications. And for the non-containerized application, we have a central config metadata store where it gets the metadata for the non-containerized applications. And as you can see, now the raw uh, IP data on the port data has been enriched with the app details that we need to build the dependency graph. And this is exposed um, as a dashboard where we can like run multiple prompt query, uh, query, queries to build our dashboards, and also it provides an API endpoint that we have been using to pull in this uh, the data to build our uh, enforcement policies and also push in this data out for compliance auditing. So we had this built, we deployed it, it was running fine for let's say for the first couple of uh, clusters until we hit our first roadblock. So as the scale increased, we noticed that you know there were inconsistencies in the data. Given that there is a, a lag between the data being recorded by the traffic observer and it being pushed to the data pipelines and it being enriched. So in order to tackle that, we noticed that we were already pushing the app metadata to the individual pods as labels. This is also being recorded by the Cilium endpoints. So we decided to tap in to the Unix socket that is exposed by Cilium on each of the endpoints. Uh, as you can see, it has all the data that we need to enrich uh, the raw IP data locally, at least on one side of the equation. So we started uh, adding the metadata that is already provided and pushing it out to the local uh, open telemetry collector. So this reduced our the load on our central pipelines by half and also vastly improved the data fidelity. Uh, along with that, we noticed a few of uh, peculiarities that were uh, there in case of some of the software load balancer cases where the natting is done. And also, uh, we found a whole bunch of host, net, host network traffic. So we were uh, sending out pointers to make life easier for our central enrichment pipeline and also reduce the overall uh, load on it. So this moved us to this architecture where we added an enricher layer in the traffic observer along with the reader and the exporter. This along with uh, 
Uh, vastly improving the fidelity. So we also had a contract with the central metric service that anything that is already enriched by the traffic observer is expected to have higher priority and the metric service is not going to act upon it and reduce the load on it. And uh, as we continue to deploy it, we hit the next challenge on uh, deploying the traffic observer on our software load balancers. So these are going to deal at very high scale at hundreds of thousands of connections and millions of uh, connections at any given point of time. So this has led to us overshooting our uh, CPU and uh, memory uh, thresholds. So we have done a whole bunch of optimizations on it. Primarily, it comes down to batching. The batching on the eBPF map reads, which like vastly improved our read times, and also batching our metric push itself. So let's say we have we read a million connections from the contract table instead of sending it all at once and incurring memory spikes. We have we kind of batched it to let's say 100k and evened out our memory usage and got rid of the memory spikes. Also, we did some uh, tuning on the Cilium parameters to make the the Cilium uh, contract garbage collected to be aggressive and reducing the timeout values for some of the half-open connections and some health connections to reduce the overall metrics itself. So this has brought down uh, the CPU and memory spikes that we're seeing back into the thresholds that we have set. Uh, so at this point, we were at more than 90% of data fidelity but we have started seeing one of cases where we have uh, seen some unexpected results. So at this point, we added something called as confidence thresholds. So when we read the data, or when the security control plane reads the data from the metric service, we have added some confidence thresholds. So in this case, the first one, we see the dependency data over a window of 24 hours. We see the specific dependency only once. We don't consider it as high confidence, we ignore it. Was the second one, which is consistently enriched all throughout the 24 hours window, and we absorb it. So this has kind of brought us close to near 100% of uh, data fidelity. Oh yeah, there's one other interesting Linux kernel bug we have encountered when running the traffic observer on the software gateways. So this happens only when the uh, eBPF map is completely filled up uh, in millions of entries. At this point, we kind of locally reproduced it, ran Linux preprof, pprofs, got the frame graphs, and it turned out that there was a bug in Linux kernel v uh, 5.15, uh, where once the map is filled up, it ends up in a locked state and cannot free the uh, free the lock and cannot assign more uh, map entries, and it leads to soft IRQ spikes and packets being dropped. So we found, uh, fortunately, a solution for this in newer kernels. We backported it, and we were able to continue the deployment of the traffic observer across the clusters. So yeah, before we conclude, yeah, these were the bunch of lessons that we learned over the journey. So the first one is to have a repeatable an automated LNP environment so that any changes we made, we were confident that we could go into production without breaking anything. And also for us to have a timeline and on how we were you know, improving or kind of deprecating the performance based on the changes that were made. And the second one, as I earlier mentioned, was the batch operations, both on the eBPF maps and also with the metrics push. And uh, also, yeah, so we have seen that we are not using much of CPU, and we have seen a lot of memory spikes. So we have moved to uh, aggressive Golang garbage collection, where we traded off higher CPU with lower uh, memory usage. And the next ones are, uh, as I earlier mentioned, some of the CDM contract tube parameters being tuned and local enrichment, which kind of reduced the overall uh, load on our entire pipeline. Uh, yeah, that concludes the talk. Yeah, so if you're interested in working 
at network and security challenges at scale we are hiring. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have a few minutes for uh, any Q&A. Hello, uh, quick question. Um, the telemetry that you were collecting on the flows themselves, did you get any statistics on the flows themselves other than number of flows, such as bytes per flow or length of time per flow when you were doing the analysis? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. Actually, right now, uh, the focus of this was to collect the dependencies. Mm -hmm. So we are not uh, you know, doing any analytics on uh, the amount, the volume of traffic that's being sent and things like that. But that's something that can be easily incorporated. Thank you. Um, if I understand correctly, so you're kind of trying to use the Cilium's connection tracking data to build the service dependency, right? So what do you think would be the gap to maybe introduce this as a new slim mode in Hubble and maybe upstream it? Like over time, there may be changes in BPF map format. You'll have to, be, you'll have to maintain them uh, internally. So do you think this is possible to upstream uh, as a potential extension to Hubble? Um, yep, yep. So uh, at least when we were working, we were more confident with our metric service scale. But yeah, we can definitely explore uh, kind of having this as a Hubble enhancement. We need to work on that, though. Right, yeah. Uh, I was talking mostly about the exporting part, not really the storage part. Um, uh, sorry, could you repeat that? No, I was talking about the exporting part, where you're actually reading the data from the connection tracking entries and just exporting. Like that piece could be uh, could be great for uh, upstream as well. Yeah, we could definitely explore that. Yeah. Thank you. Great job.